Welcome to Inside the Hype.tv podcast, the show that takes you into the world of bees. I'm Dr. Umberto Bon Cristiani. In this episode, I spoke with Mario Jacob, the former owner of DNJ Apiary, who recently sold his company and comfortably retired at a younger age, proving that it is still possible to make a good living from honeybees. Mario was a board member of the American Beekeeping Federation, among many other accolades. In this conversation, we discussed the secrets to become a successful commercial beekeeper, his favorite business model, and the constant challenge faced by commercial beekeepers in the United States. And now, I introduce to you, Mario Jacob. Hello, Mario. It is very good to have you here in the show. Welcome to the show. I'm trying to do this interview for a while, and we're finally making. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good. Our, our schedules were quite busy, so yes, we finally got together. I want to start this conversation, Mario. You know, th- the reason why I want to bring you here to the show for a long time is that I think you are a phenomen- phenomenal example of commercial beekeeper, a successful commercial beekeeper that... I, I used in my daily base as a as a template as an example of how thing how things should be done. Uh, I learned a lot when we worked together in the past, and I, I want to to get a lot of things from these conversations. A little bit of, you know, I want to introduce you to my audience. I want to take a little advice from you about what commercial beekeeper do in a ba- daily basis you know what the, what are the challenges and i want to start this conversation asking you a little bit about you and and an overview about the dnj apiary which is the apiary that you build up very successfully well thank you um you know when i've been doing this basically since high school and in high school uh my grandfather and my stepdad, who are the D and J of D and J apiaries, they were running about 300 hives, um, you know, by hand, um, had an old 78 forward one ton with no AC, you know, just an old truck. And we had uh, a small honey house about the size of a garage and everything, like I said, was, was done by hand. Uh, none of it was palletized or mechanized. And um, so believe it or not, when I came to them and I said, look, I want to do this for a living, um, we had to figure out, you know, how to make that kind of that next step. Because we were, you know, we were bigger than a backyard or sideliner, but we weren't quite commercial. So what I did is I went to work for the biggest guy that we it was in our county around this area. And at the time, he was running, I don't know, 6,000, 7,000 bees, somewhere in that ballpark. And, um, you know, so I learned a tremendous amount um, in those two years. Um, you know, uh, working for them, they, I had to get my CDL because now we're not driving small one tons. We're driving, you know, big trucks. And, um uh, you know, they're using bobcats for moving out in the field. They're using forklifts. Everything is, is palletized. Everything is very efficient. And and I learned from that, that uh, that is one of the key things that I think, you know, time management and, and not wasting uh, trips and, and trying to get as much on. Obviously, as most beekeepers know, commercial guys, you're always trying to get that extra pallet or load or whatever on the truck to get down the road because you don't want to come back and waste the time, fuel, and, and you know, labor to, to get it. So um, it taught me how to set up bee yards. Uh, very important. Different, there, you know, there's a whole different aspect of if you're doing it by hand versus by a, by a bobcat or, or, you know, by a loader of some sort, swinger, whatever. And, um, you know, it... it it really, it it really helped me to to figure these things out. Plus, I was getting paid, um, you know, to kind of learn. I, I took all that. Um, surprisingly, though, two years after that, um, we I actually went to work for another bee, a commercial bee operation in town, and uh, they were a little smaller, uh, ran about three thousand or so hives, but they did wax rendering. So they had a different aspect of their business. 
and I learned the wax industry, how to render wax, how foundation was made. Um, and they ran bees completely different than my previous uh, employer did. And I learned that you don't have to do it one way. So I picked up some of the things that I liked from both commercial um, you know, beekeepers, and, and I chose the best that worked for me. I, I'm not going to say that it, it's correct, but it just that's what I chose and I liked. It, and it really helped me um, kind of see that, 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 you know, there's not just more than one way to do this. You just got to figure out what you want to do and how you like it. So, yeah, let me show you. Uh, we have some, um, where is it? I have some slides here. So, so you can tell me a little bit about DNJ Apiary. Here you go. This is the logo, right? The DNJ. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. We came up, uh, actually, my wife kind of helped design that logo. Um, because before that there was really no hard logo and, um, you know, that we, she says we definitely have to brand ourselves. And as you can see, the, the D and the J came from Dave Westervelt and John Westervelt. And, you know, we are, they registered the company back in 83 with the state. So it's been a corporation for a while. Uh, me and my wife bought it completely out, um, in 2005. I mean, obviously after the two years plus two years so a full year stint after you know from high school I went to work for D&J and, and you know ran it I had stocks in it because um, I took my bees um, I had bought a truck and you know we we combined our resources and um, you know built in but then finally bought my grandfather completely out and um, in 2011 uh, which we'll talk about a little later we started a, a, a retail business out there um you know and thank god my wife believed me because we did it on a leap of faith it was just out of the blue i said you know we're going to do this and um you know the new facility uh, opened in in 15 so about four years later after this i had no idea if it was going to work so it was just a complete leap of faith yeah we we're gonna touch base a little bit more on uh, the business model that you create, that you developed and tested, uh, but just let let me just let me just show the the rest of the pictures here, so we Not can problem. Yep, go that direction. So here we go. This is John Westernveld, your grandfather, right? Correct. Yeah. Hey, Westernveld. Yeah, my dad. David. And shout out to David, fantastic guy. Pleasure to call him a friend. So why you Matilla? Well, um, believe it or not, we can all kind of trace our roots back to two uh, beekeepers. I found out when I did a little bit of research um, back into the even early 20s. Um, I know they were there during the 40s, during the Second World War, because um, we had, well, let me go back. So we had the Muth and Art Bruce settled in Umatilla. And at the time, there was a, an air, a small airstrip there. And orange groves, that was all that was there. But in town, we actually had um, a, say in the 80s, we had a day dance facility, which you got your bee supplies from. You had uh, Sue Bee, where you could sell your honey to, and they were bottling honey there. And you had Randall's Waxworks, which made, um, you know, your foundation. Before the modern plastic foundation inserts, it was all natural beeswax. And on the bottom of that picture, you saw Henry and Frank Randall. That's the second person that I went to. They had Randall's Wax Works that we eventually bought out. Um, and their son, Tony, and grandson, Scott, actually came and worked for me. Uh, he was actually my right hand for many, many years. Um, and, you know, like I said, the area there, uh, now in Umatilla to this day, there are still 11 commercial beekeepers. But it's funny that we can kind of trace our roots back to two guys that settled that area and somehow, you know, worked for these people and, you know, broke off and started their own commercial bee company. And we can all kind of trace it back. Yeah, that's what I, I like those those stories is that, you know, there is a, this whole tradition, localized, things happen, people start to get together, and there's a whole history in the whole Florida, actually, 
a lot of a lot of commercial guys in different areas there have different stories. Very very fascinating stories. Let me let me move this forward. So this is data material facility. So it's one of the foundations why you guys establish yourself there because you have that support, right? Correct. I mean, you could buy your B boxes, your frames, everything there. They actually at that time had their own wood mill there. They brought the wood in on rail cars and they would mill the own, their own wood in house at that facility. So this is the new new facility. Of this new facility. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, I don't think we had any pictures of the old ones, but um, just um, you know, I built it as we we could afford and uh originally we had two school portable buildings the reason i got those one they were inexpensive and secondly they met code for the county you know handicapped bathrooms and you know all the proper fire escape stuff that you had to have to to pass code so uh, i brought those in and you know for four years we retailed out of them and they worked and we basically outgrew them, and uh, we started, you know, realizing really quickly that we needed more space. And so we, actually, that building there, you can't see it. Well, you can kind of see it, but uh, different roof line. It's been added on to about three times. And I, as I could afford, we expanded, and um, we kept it's growing and growing. Right here. Yep. Yeah, that's the office. The one in the back was the original warehouse. And then we added on to the warehouse, and then we added on the extra wing where the trailer is in the classroom now. See, we had originally, yep, that's the classroom there, and there's just the loading area there. So that's the classroom, that's the wing. So it's, it was added on to, you know. And that was the new um, showroom um, inside. Um, so, you know, we had our products that we were selling there. Um, I don't think, I don't know, keep slide. I don't know if I have a picture of the classroom there or not. No, that's just the right behind it, that wall where the windows is, is our classroom where we actually teach B classes and seminars. And, um, it really worked out well for us. People know about you now, your background, you built a very successful commercial beekeeping operation in Florida, basically from scratch, learning from the people that you trusted and combining different styles of beekeeping to get your own. So can, let me ask you something. I want to I want to take this conversation more to the business side of the beekeeping. Since I, I am in a consultant business now, and I also identify this, there are so many ways to do, and many so many beekeepers that do things in a different ways. And I, I was able to see things that, I like it, things that I don't like it, and combine styles that create my foundation to help other beekeepers to start testing different models and different styles. I think you you you, you did exactly the same. I want to ask you the same. I want to ask you something, Mario. How was the? I know we covered this a little bit at the beginning, but how you co- How was the business model of G D and J at the beginning? And how was the progression and, and, the, and the reasons why you moved to that direction in your business model? Do you get more honey? Do you get wax? Well, what was the driving force of the operation along the years? Well, when my grandfather and my dad ran it, you know, it was solely honey production. You know, they produced honey, put it in drums, sold it. That was it. And, what you know, when I took, well, even when I started working for the Randalls and, and different things, I saw there was opportunity in pollination. They were doing pollination for blueberries and, and watermelons and, and you know, uh, so there was money to be made in that that we never really touched on, I guess. You know, so I'm like, okay, we can do this. And I saw from them also the wax. You know, there's money to be made in wax. Um. So when there was an opportunity later on, we bought them out and bought their facilities and their, their equipment out. And, you know, right now we're still one of the only people in the Southeast. I, I still got people from Alabama, Georgia, and all over Florida that bring us their wax cappings. And, you know, we render slum gum. We run their wax cappings on a commercial scale, not on a, you know, 
backyard scale, everything that the, the equipment is set up for running 55 gallon drums of, you know, cappings or slum gum. And there's money to be made in that because nobody else is doing it. Um, we got into the queen business. Queen business was more a necessity. <laughs> necessity is the mother of all inventions. I mean, we couldn't get queens when we needed them. Um, you know, everybody was one queen at the same time and we couldn't get them. So, well, if I can't buy them, I'll make them. So we started, um, you know, making our own queens. And um, I want to give a shout out really to uh, the Mitzka family down here in Florida. Um, because, you know, the bee industry is a small industry. And sometimes, you know, some of the trade secrets people don't want to let all their secrets out, you know, to keep them close to your pocket. But I went over there and they showed me their operation. I actually went over there for about a week and helped to work side by side with them and learned. And um, not that I would, they were afraid that I was going to take their business away. Um, you know, they were very open and, and nice to teach me uh, the avenue of that side of the, the, biz, the business and the bees that I didn't know. And so, you know, I took that information, brought it back, trained up some guys, and, um, you know, they were doing that aspect for me. But I, you know, I basically had to know how to do that. I think that's one of the things, too, that I know we're going to talk about a little bit later. But as a successful businessman, you have to know every aspect of your business. You can't rely on somebody else. You need to know it. Um, and then obviously we got into the retail part. Um, you know, that was kind of, a when we bought out the wax, everybody was bringing their wax to us to render in Umatilla and had been doing so for years. And they would then normally, as the wax was done, they would pick it up from, you know, the Randalls and take it up to Data Ant and buy their bee supplies or trade it in on bee supplies. Well, they didn't close their facility in U in Umatilla, and they're one up in um, Georgia, and they moved to High Springs, Florida, which is halfway in between the two places, and put a new facility. Well, that meant that all the people from Umatilla had to drive up there, and all the people from Georgia had to drive down. Well, since we had so many commercial guys in town and other commercial guys bringing me stuff from all over, they said, hey, why don't you get some bee supplies and we'll just buy them from you and we don't have to make the drive. And so I did. Um, originally I was geared commercial, uh, totally towards commercial aspect of it. I mean, I really did not even think about the backyard beekeeper. Um, and quickly about six months to a year into having the retail shop open, we quickly learned that honestly, there's a huge market for backyard beekeepers. Um, you know, they, they are wanting the supplies, they're wanting knowledge more than anything. And that's how we started doing the classes. So, um, you know, the, it, it was just, we had to learn to adapt. Always improving and do not be afraid of the opportunities that was on your face, right? You see the opportunities there and you was, were not afraid to change things and take advantage of the things that are happening around you. Well, I mean, there's always in business you have to you have to be willing to change. Business will never stay the same. It's always evolving, and you have to do that. I think in any business, um, you know. Uh, so we we just had to adapt, um, and some of it we wanted to do, and some of it we were forced to do. You know, with say the queens, we were forced to do it because yeah. we couldn't get any. Um, you know, and then like the retail store is something that, you know, Hey, why not try this and just see where it goes. And it was scary for a little while. I'm not going to lie. My wife will tell you for the first six months we were open, the phone didn't ring. You know, we, nobody kind of knew that where we were and who we were and that we had supplies for sale. Then as the word got out, um, you know, it just, it just grew rapidly. I mean, it snowballed. I never thought it would grow as fast as it did. Yeah. But it's it's beautiful to see when see when something is working and you just the uh, ball rolling and and make you feel better and 
that you go into the, the right direction. And that's a good hook to a conversation that I want to have to you, Mario, is that I don't know if people know, but you you retired as a young age very successfully doing bees, you know, and a lot of people are scared and sometimes don't even believe that it's possible. So you're, you're in a very good position today, retired. Uh, with the bees, um, and is still working in the in the industry as a consultant, and and I want to pick a brain about the business side of bees because when I something that I is my mojo, where wherever I go, and you have this, I remember when we worked together. Said, well, I I'm useless here. Mario Mario can take care of everything. He knows. He knows what's the you know the main secret of any business and beekeeping is that test everything. Don't trust anybody. Don't trust any brand. Make sure everything is functioning, and and you have that in your DNA. I, w- I would like to ask you, you know, how was your approach about you know making sure you you are in the right direction in your business side and in the beekeeping side. Well, I you learn um, on the B side. As far as the business side, numbers never lie, and I've always been a numbers guy. Um, never was good at spelling, but I was good at math. I was always a numbers guy, and um, you know, I at one point we had wrapped up the the operation, and we were running close to five thousand hives. Um, you know, had seven seven full-time employees plus myself. I mean, I was running up and down the roads, um, you know, hardly home with my family. Um, And at the end of that year, I looked at the, you know, profit and loss and, and, you know, looked at the actual data and and the numbers and I go, you know, I'm spending all this time, but all, all the money that's coming in is going right back out. And the money's going back out, you know, for labor and fuel and, and, maintenance on the vehicles and just everything and i learned then that it's not all about how much money and i see this in in, in a lot of businesses um not just the bee industry i see it in restaurant businesses and stuff people what i call turning money so yeah that they're bringing money in but it's going right back out so you're not actually making a profit you know you you got you made twenty thousand this month but you got you know 19,500 expenses going back out. So how much have you actually made? You know, it's just turning money. Um, and I learned that when I, we actually cut back on the number of bees and cut employees back and my expense was less, my stress was less. And I actually kept more money in my pocket at the end of the year. And so I, I did that as far as, you know, um, that was just, a, that was a big eye opener for me. Because I always thought, you know, everybody around was always how many bees you had. You know, the bigger the number, the, the more successful you had to be. You know, oh, my God, you're running 5,000. Oh, I'm running 8,000. Oh, I've got 10,000. And it just seemed like always these big numbers. And then I got to looking at it. It seemed like all you're doing is chasing your tail, you know. So, um, and, and my wife was, uh, you know, my secretary. And I have her even you know, when we got more successful every quarter, at least for me, it was every month I was running profit and loss. I wanted to know where the money was going, what money we had. Is there any way to cut expenses? You know, I, every month, no lie. I would, I was, we caught that the, the, the garbage company went up on our rates just because they wanted to go up on our rates. I caught it because I mean, it was, you know, like 20, 30 bucks, but I caught it. And we called them up, you know, I was like, hey, what's going on here? You know, but if you're not paying attention to that, little things like that will slip through you. Um, And then as far as testing stuff, you know, I, on the B side, we always tested, you know, things. I mean, especially with with chemicals. I never trusted that the chemical was going to work. I hope it did, but I always took test hives and we ran a test, and twice I can tell you it saved my operation. I mean, there, there was one time 
Um, you know, we used a we used a chemical uh, up in upstate New York. It worked great. Brought the bees back down. Wanted to treat for mites again. Didn't work in Florida. Too much humidity. We found out later on. But had I taken just the the word that oh it works. I would have not known that it wouldn't. And there was one time, another time, that we actually treated the hives. And I went back and and rechecked after the treatment. And come to find out, our mite load was actually higher and was growing higher. And I was like, guys, what's going on? Did you not treat this right? You know, first my first reaction was something that my guys did. You know, I'm like, hey, guys, what happened here, you know? And they're like, no, 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 boss, we did it just like he said, you know. And so I went out to the field. I went with him. I did it myself. Still, results were the same. It was not treating the mites. So we pivoted. I mean, literally, from one day to the next, we switched everything, switched the chemicals that we're using, and retreated the whole operation, which was very costly. I mean, first, we I had bought the initial treatment that didn't work. So you got the cost of the chemical plus the labor and time to get it on the bees and then having to pivot and do the same thing again and having to play catch up because, you know, now we've got a higher mite load than, than we would normally have. And I mean, we lost some bees and it was hard to catch up, but I saved the bees. So I think, you know, this industry, there's it's a small industry, and that's one thing I wanted to say too. I think is important that you have good connections. You need good connections. You know, if something's not working, you know, I'll pick up the phone. You know, I've got connections with you know the B labs and and say, hey, you know, have you guys tested this? Is something not working? You know, um, and also. In the industry itself, you want to make sure that your name means something. And I, and I hope that when I left this industry, I haven't completely left it, but, you know, when I left it, you know, I had done, you know, eight years as, as an ABF uh, director. I had made contacts and we had gone out to those meetings and it wasn't so much for the meeting aspect of it, but you made connections. You you got to, to know other beekeepers and... Um, I think for a new guy, if, if if you're wanting to start out, I think that's huge. You know, um, if I had a problem that something that I didn't know about was out of my wheelhouse, I had, you know, a phone that had numerous contacts in it that I could call and at least get some kind of an idea or answer. And I think that's huge. I really do that, that uh, you know, if you are in this business and you burn bridges, you're not going to last very long. You know, you have to make sure that, you know, you stay by your word. And I've made deals, trust me, that I've gotten burned on and I honored them knowing that it was a bad deal because I gave my word. And um, I, sometimes I tell you that they, they, didn't, they didn't set well with me, but I did it because I said I would. And um, I think, you know, those keeping your word, I think is, is, is important. And, um, you know, I can still call, I still have the phone numbers and the contacts. I still call some of my B friends, not for B advice anymore. I'm, I'm checking on them, see how they're doing, but it's important that if something does happen, that you can count on people that may know something that you don't know. And that's important. Always learning, always growing, you know, in any business, you know, the secret to, you know, is a stable environment to do business is trust. You know, there are relationships and transfer of wealth between people. And if there is no trust on something that was agreed upon, it's, it's always a recipe for a disaster for any economy. Mario, going back to the business model, I want to ask you, what's, what was the, your sweet spot regarding number of bees employees and machines for you to generate the maximum profit with the minimum costs for for the way you like to to run your bees i'm well i'm going to say what i did and i'm not saying this is no, this is no the one and all eight. um i found that for about every 500 to 700 hives you needed an employee or or a hired man you know you needed some kind of extra hand to be efficient i mean you can do it yourself but 
efficiency, you, you needed that kind of to labor, you know. Um, my sweet spot was about 2,400, you know, say between 2,000 and 5,000, we hovered the bees right around 23 to 24, which, you know, you're always going to have losses and gains because you're splitting and, and whatnot. So, you know, we, we tried to be there in that sweet spot. And as far as employees go, basically for that, I had five uh, guys, which we call it back of the house and front of the house. So we had employees in the front that were, you know, doing the retail side of things. And we had the back of the house, which was doing the bees and the queens and whatnot. Um, so we had five full-time employees in the back. And um, I was kind of the floater, if you will. I was the you know, if they needed me up front, I would be up front. If somebody was sick that day or whatever, if they needed me in the back, I could do both jobs. You know, um, I like being out in the field more. I could tell you that the office <laughs> work was not my favorite, but it had to be done. You know, I, I'll be honest. I probably made more money sitting in that office making deals on the phone than I ever did, you know, being behind the wheel of a truck or, or checking a beehive. But that's where my love was. I love being out in the field with the guys, you know, and, um, I trust my guys I had good guys. Um, really did. I think that's the other key thing is finding good help and keeping good help. Um, and I will tell you, I honestly, and I'm very proud of these individuals. I really am, but I had three individuals that worked for me that broke off on their own. And now they have a commercial, uh, you know, successful B business, um, you know, now here close to Umatilla, very close to Umatilla. Matter of fact, one is in Umatilla, one's two towns away. And, um, I'm proud of them. I mean, they, they'll tell you, you know, they, they, they work for me. They put in some time, some sweat and, and they learned and they were smart enough to, to say, Hey, I can do this. And they went off on their own. And they started small, you know, started with just getting a couple of hundred hives and got a truck and a bobcat and, you know, started working that way. And then got to where they had their own honey house and bigger trucks and more bees and the same thing. And um, like I said, I've got, that's how we started. Most guys don't just jump out there and go, hey, I want to be a commercial beekeeper, not knowing. It's it's more of less for what I'm seeing in industry is it's an uh, it's an apprenticeship program. Either you were born into it, you know, your second third generation, yep. or you went to work for somebody and you learn. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And like I said, you really want to train up a guy and you want him to be self sufficient. But the problem is if he's smart enough, by the time you train him up and you know get him where he can drive a bobcat and have a CDL and drive a, a big truck and know how to inspect bees, he's going to be just about right to leave you. <laughs> and then you got to train somebody else up all together. They so, swarm. And, yeah, they swarm on you. Yeah, that's a good that's a good way of putting it. So, um, but like I said, I didn't have any ill will in towards those employees. I mean, I, you know, we were actually, some, some of them, you know, worked with us, say, hey, I've got a pollination contract that I can't cover right now for whatever reason. Can you cover it for me? You know, and, or, hey, I need an extra bee yard because I've got some splits. I don't have a place to set. Yeah, I've got an extra yard over here. And that's where that communication really is key in keeping those contacts with beekeepers, you know, um, and just be honest with them. Say, hey, look, I, you know, I'm only going to use it or tell them, hey, you can only use this bee yard for one year, but I'll let you use it for a year. You know, don't, don't try to steal my bee yard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It yeah, is. So. Mario, when, when you're running in your full capacity, using your sweet spot that you remember and described here to us today, what was the model that you were following? What's the ratio? Was honey, pollination, queens? What what was the the model that you're using in your sweet spot? Well, we had probably about a quarter of the, the income was pollination. 
And honestly, I would have never thought this was mostly California, though we do have some, we had, we always had some blueberry and some watermelon contracts here in Florida. Um, but, um, honestly, when everybody was jumping on that bandwagon, um, I told them they were nuts. I said, there's no way I'm going to ship bees halfway across the country. You know, they're sitting on the back of a truck. If they're on team drivers, two teams, that never that truck never stops. It's still three days. If it's just a single driver, it's a minimum of five to six days that those bees are on the back of the truck from Florida to California. I mean, it's hard on bees. And I said, man, these guys are just crazy. There's no way I'm doing this. And then the money got to where, guess what? I looked into it and it became a very big part of my annual income. Um, so that's a one way of the saying that even me was fighting it, I finally had to go with it because the money was just the numbers. Once again, I told you, numbers don't lie. And the numbers said that it was very profitable and it needed to be something that we did to be profitable. Um, the rest of it probably was uh, honey. Um, and then I'd probably say a quarter was honey, a quarter was queens and nuke sales, which were directly then combined with our retails because we would then have people that wanted to get in the bees and they would buy our nukes. And then, you know, a year later they needed to requeen or they're making splits and they would come back and buy queens from us. So it kind of gave us a growing, uh, you know, a, a growing, basically people that constantly just knew, Hey, we can get queens and, and, and bees from D&J, and so it became a big part of our, you know, our final financial plan, which really wasn't what we were planning to do. Originally, the, the queen operation was just to give me the queens I needed to keep my bees alive and requeen and make my splits. It was never intended, really, to go for selling queens. I never started the business for that. Um, I, I did it just to because I needed queens, and then it funny it, it morphed into well, all right we'll sell some and i never really got into the big i let mitzka you know he didn't like running small one two five queens ten queens it was more of a headache for him he he liked shipping you know 100 200 yeah. queens out the door so i didn't like dealing with that because I never knew exactly what I would have because I was running a smaller queen operation than he was. You know, we didn't have as many nuke, uh, queen mating nuke boxes as he did. We were just running a, a ramp down or smaller scale operation. So I was okay, you know, because I would have extra, say, 40 or 50 queens in the bank. Well, a big guy, he, you know, a commercial guy, he wants 100 at a time. Well, small guys, they only want one or two. So I can, you know, I can sell, you know, 40 to 40 people. And I, they were happy. And so what I did is I actually contacted Mitzka and said, hey, I'll give you all the big guys. You send me all the small guys. And it was beneficial to both of us. You see what I'm saying? Yep. You know, yep. it worked out for him. And it worked out for me. You know, so when I, we got a call, hey, we want 100. I said, hey, you know, call Mitzka. He's probably better. You know, he can probably help you out better than I can. And then if somebody went over to him, was like, hey, I just need three. Like, yeah, go talk to Mario D&J. He can hook you up. Yeah, collaboration. You need to find those win-win situations. Yeah, and so it, it worked out. Mario, talking about California a, li a little bit, I remember you have concerns like you described, but while you were doing, you also have concern about the exposure of the bees there. How, how was your model there? You, you, sell, you sell your hives there or you bring it back? And how you... What? mitigate the problem with exposure and pesticide exposures there? We did sell some bees. Most of the time, most of the years, we brought them back, which is a huge expense because you, you're on the hook for the trucking out and back. Um, so obviously, if you use sell a load, you just pay trucking out, you get the pollination contract, and then somebody else buys the bees and, you know, one, you get the, the sale of the bees and you don't have to get the trucking back, um, which is the best way to do it, but it's not always, you can't always find a buyer for the bees. Um, I was very much, um, afraid of California. 
I hate to say it, it's a cesspool. It really is. You've got so many different B operations from all over the United States, and you have no idea what kind of viruses or you know, chemicals they got in their bees or their hives. And then, you know, the hive dies and your bees goes, robs them out. Now, lo and behold, all of a sudden you've got that in your hive. And these loading yards they have out there, I mean, they're huge loading yards. You know, they have, you know, 20, 30 semi loads of bees in there at one time. I hated when I had one semi load sitting at, at my field. I mean, the drift that was happening there and, you know, bees, they would pick on the weak hives. I just, it was terrible. So what I did to try to mitigate that or, or minimize the, the exposure was most of the United States sent their bees out early. You know, they, they got them out there and guys would spread them out. So I got with beekeepers um, and I always dealt with beekeepers. I didn't deal with brokers. I wanted to know the guy. I have been to his house. I have sat down at his table, had dinner with him. So I know where he's at. If something goes south, I at least know where he's at. You know, <laughs> not just a broker over the phone. Um, and I would tell him, I said, look, every day you let my bees sit in Florida, they're growing. They're not going backwards. You know, this the, in the springtime here in Florida, bees are just exploding. So every day you give me here, I'm just giving you a better beehive for the broker or for the the farmer. And um, so what we did is we wait, we were the last ones in, you know, they would get all the other bees from wherever they were up North and some of them out of those potato uh, ponds and huts that they would overwinter bees, you know, they would get those in there. And then the very last bees to hit right before the bloom opened would be, you know, bees from Florida. And I, I'm not the only one that did this. There's a couple of commercial guys here that did this. And we all worked kind of together, too, because it was a mad dash at the last. I mean, you're trying to get everything done at the last minute, get them on the truck, get the trucks lined up, get them out there. Um, there was one year, I remember, I-10 was froze. They couldn't get them in. You know, they had to reroute the trucks. Um, you know, always problems with California and their ag expectation. You know, they, they oh, well, the bees, you know, are not clean. They need to go wash the bees or whatever. Um, and... Once again, I had good truck drivers. I used the same group of guys year after year, and, you know, and I don't ask questions, but they always got my bees where they needed to go, and it was worth every penny that they charged me. So I'm just going to leave it at that, but they, they got my bees where they needed to go. Good. <laughs> good. You know, but uh, that was the arrangement we had worked out, and, and it worked. Once again, it was I was dealing with beekeepers direct. Um, and it's important. I flew out there. Uh, as you know, I, I flew out there. I met guys. I wanted to see where my bees were at. I wanted to check the bees. I, when I was out there, I was once again making sure, you know, those guys out there were, were spraying, you know, not only pesticides, but we found out fungicides were really harmful to bees. You know, until we started realizing that, we're like, why are these bees coming back from California and then having huge losses? And we figured out it was partly because of fungicides that they're spraying. So once again, you know, we went out there and figured this out and, and going, I think it's important that you go out there and, and meet not only whoever you're dealing with, but look at your bees in the grower, meet the grower if you can. Shake the grower's hand, you know, put a face there so he understands that, hey, I'm here to help you, but in the same token, you got to be here to help me, you know, and you minimize your spray if you spray at nighttime. You know, can you, can you do something to help me out? Can you wait till I get my bees out? You know, questions like that. You, so. you always never assuming anything. That's, that's something that you're always testing. You're always making sure whatever you think is happening is happening in reality. And that's a, one of the, the main things that I see in the industry today. A lot of, a lot of beekeepers with a lot of assumptions and when I go there and test and talk with the crew, talk, see with my eyes, and I bring the information back, I said, sir, everything you said never happened. You know, you need to believe me. It, in your mind, things are going to a direction that you think is right because of your experience. But never, the thing never happened. And it's sometimes 
Sometimes they believe me, sometimes they don't. I'll, I'll leave it at. Yeah. Well, I can tell you from, from my experience, um, I had a, a quick, I'll give you two quick uh, analogies of that. We had a beekeeper here that, um, I'm not going to name his name, but he got older and he trusted his, his workers to do all the work. And I had a bee yard, you know, right down the road from him. So I went to him and afterwards I said, Mike, I said, um, you need to, you need to go check your bees. He says, no, 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 my guy's got it. He says they're doing good. And I looked at him, I said, Mike, I said, you need to get in your truck and you need to go check your bees. He didn't. Uh, about a year and a half later, he was out of business. Um, it's a, it's an unfortunate thing. I will tell you honestly, I trusted my guys, had great guys. But there would still be times during the week I'd send my guys out and I would get in my pickup truck and I would just show up. And they would be totally surprised. They'd be like, what are you doing here? I said, I'm working with you today. Well, why didn't you just jump in with us in the truck? I said, I just had a few extra hours, so I wanted to come out here and work with you. And I never knew when I would show up. I would just show up. And I would work with them right beside them, checking everything that they were doing. Not that I didn't trust them, but they never knew. It kept them honest. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I think a lot of times people don't go back and check. And the, the other story that was funny, I sat in Horace Bell's office. And if anybody knows who Horace Bell is, you know he's a character. <laughs> but he said, and he says, you know what, Mario? I said, we ought to start a rumor. I said, what kind of rumor is that, Horace? He's like, you know, we ought to invest in, the, in a chicken farm and then tell all the beekeepers that if you put chicken manure on the beehives, it'll cure the mites. We could be millionaires. And I laughed, and after I got out of there, I thought to myself, it's very true, because a lot of beekeepers don't test their own product, you know, on their own bees. They just, well, you know, Billy Bob down the road put it on, and it worked for him, so it's got to work for me. How do you know it's working for you? I mean, unless you actually test, how do you know it's working for you? And I, I, I knew a lot of people in this industry that, you know, there was a lot of hearsay. You know, hey, so and so's doing this, so and so's doing that, and and you know, I just never, I never got into that aspect of it. I, I just did what I did and tested and kept on going down the road. It's been one of my main challenges, Mario, to try to convince people about the necessity of testing and make sure things are working before we complete your plan or move into different directions. Uh, it's, it's really hard to change people's minds sometimes. It's, and then it just, I even say no to a couple of guys that I know is not going to do the work, you know, and then it's going to hurt my reputation. I said, look, you, 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 you take care of your own destiny. I'm just here to advise. But if you don't do the job, I can't, I can't help you. And I think that was one reason why you and me got together and uh, worked so well together was the fact that we were both after the truth. We didn't yeah. care about anything else except what was the end result. And if it was good or bad, if it hurts my feelings, I don't care. I want to know the truth at the end of it. You know, it, it's uh, some people just want to hear the, uh, the fairy tale ending. You know, it may not be the fairy tale ending. I want to know what's, what's really going to happen, what's going to work. It's not going to work. How do I, if there's a problem, how do I solve the problem? Keep moving forward. I think that's the biggest thing is just yeah. keep moving forward. And I think that's why I, I enjoyed working with you and, and you are no BS guy. And I, I, I really appreciated that. So. And I, I appreciate your, I, I remember I, I'm, I'm laughing now. People at home to know why I'm laughing. When I, when I met Mario first time, very straightforward. It was kind of fun, like conversations and we just try to, you know, find the truth from each other and testing each other was a was a lot of fun until we start to, okay, this is a serious guy. This is legit. And then we, we got along so well and continued the relationship and the work for so many years. That was fun. So, it was. I yeah. enjoyed it. Yes. Well, Mario, this is very good information for everybody at home. Um, so I want to have a last question for you before we wrap this up. Where where do you see the business going? You know, the future of commercial beekeeping here in America, and what's the biggest threat for for the industry now? 
Well, I think bees are always important. I mean, you know, it's maybe the pollination is more important than the actual honey that they produce, but bees are so important to our agriculture and, you know, the whole farming as a whole. Um, I think there's always going to be, or there's going to be a need for bees in some aspect. So, uh, you know, you may not want to be the guy that does the pollination or the honey, but you may find raising queens is something that you'd like to do. Well, there's going to be commercial bee guys or pollinators that need queens to replace their queens. So, you know, I think there's always going to be a need for every aspect of the um, commercial side of, of things. You know, whether you're a queen breeder, whether you're a pollinator, whether you're a honey producer, um, you know, even the supplies that uh, that come out, you know, there's always going to be a need for, you know, somebody to cut bee boxes and, and produce the equipment that is needed for this commercial uh, enterprise. Um, the challenges facing, I think, have been pretty much, I think, the same um, in the industry would be, you know, you, you have to keep your mites, your beetles, all these pests that we are now facing that we didn't have before, or maybe even new pests that are coming on the horizon that we don't know about, um, keep them in check. Make sure your bees are healthy. Um, the, lo the loss of land, I think, is one of the big things that is out there. You know, here in Florida especially, man, it's no lie. I can see it. And we say they got a thousand people a day move into this state, and I believe it because I mean the amount of not houses but apartments. These are apartments that they're putting up. It's just crazy. Uh, I mean, you know, I sold out uh, less than five years ago, and right before I sold out in one of the spots, there was still an orange grove there, and I had bees there. And today, there is nothing but apartments in that spot, and that's in the less of a span of five years. So, you know, losing the habitat is, is, is a big issue, I think, for the honey-producing side of things. Um, um, keeping up with, you know, finding good help. A lot of guys are just, I hate to say it, they can't find good local help. So they're going to H2A workers where they're going, you know, getting uh, help from other countries, Guatemala, Ecuador, um, you know, Costa Rica, some of these guys. And these guys are here to work. They are very smart. They they know bees um, from their country. You might have to train them on, you know, how you want things done in your, your aspect. But these guys are here to work. They're not here to, to mess around. They want to work. And I can't say the same for, I hate to say, domestic workers. You know, they're here to do their nine to five and get, get their paycheck on Friday. And, you know, I was lucky and had local guys that I could call literally. And I had at three o'clock in the morning and say, hey, we got an issue. We got to move a bee yard. Okay, boss, I'll be there. You know, and didn't question things. I mean, you know, they knew the time of the years where we were moving bees and getting bees ready for California. There was a lot of long, you know, hours involved. I mean, some of these guys would have, you know, 70, 80 hours a week during those busy times. But they also knew during the slow times, you know, they would be lean on make sure they get their paycheck. Um, but, you know, that was part of things that I think one of my biggest stress levels was not only was I worried about my family, I had to provide for eight other families. Yeah. I had to make sure that they had a Christmas, you know, make sure that not only was this business supporting me, but I, I really took care. I really went out and, and made sure my guys were taken care of. You know, we, we made sure that, you know, after we got everything to California and, and, you know, we could breathe and we had a slow down period. Hey guys, you know, let them take you out on a fishing trip. You know, I'll, you know, I'll pay, you know, we'll have a, we'll have a good, you know, company barbecue, invite the families in and have a barbecue and, and, and a fish fry or something. And, and really that boosted morale that kept everybody, you know, happy to work. And, and when, when the boss did call you at three o'clock in the morning, you answered that phone, you know, yeah. Yeah. I think that was important. Those are some of the things that I think that are really important that, um, that the industry's facing. I think, Part of that too is um, 
it, the one other challenge I think is you have to be a businessman. You can be as good as you can be as a beekeeper, but if you are lacking on the business side, you need to either learn that or find somebody that you can trust that can help you with that, you know, a spouse that can, can run the numbers and the books. Um, because I see it so often. I see, I see great beekeepers, but they're struggling. They're not growing. And I think the biggest problem is they're not, you know, paying attention to the numbers. Yeah, and, uh, that that's a big, big problem. I think as far as some of the industry, I think that they honestly need to have more classes. They had some of those at the ABF and I thought they were, they were really well attended. People liked them. Is that bring in a professor that it's a, you know, a, a business professor, teach more business things that, um, you know, just because you're good at being a farmer might not mean that you're good as a being a, a businessman. You know, I think those were really, really well attended seminars at the ABF that they had. Uh, and, um, I went to some of them myself. I learned things I did and I thought they were really, really important. So does that answer? i answer any you know all your questions well, i'll be glad to answer some more i enjoy talking to you so yeah you know if you got anything be glad to, to uh... I, I just just thinking now when you mention all those things and i just come to my mind i i, I think i agree with you 100 percent of that and it because it's my experience too the, all the all the people that i help in my my business I, i'm not dealing more with with the the keeping issues you know, most of the beekeepers there, they have a very good idea what about beekeeping knowledge. What, what's been the problem most of the time is they cannot identify the business problems, you know, how much, where, where, they, where they're bleeding. You know, they can't see, they don't know, they don't control the numbers. They don't have good books. They, and when you, when you have the experience, you know, you just step in in the operation, you start to look around, you, you kind of know, right? You kind of know this is... There is no way this is ro- this is right, you know. It's probably bleeding here, bleeding there, and, and one of the main things that I got is is a problem with uh, working with some guys that even to touch base. Look, there is some subject they don't even want to talk about. You know, it's just and I I just kind of how, you know, yep. is it hurting you and you don't want to fix it, and it's just so contradicting to me and I. Some people get even mad at me. It's a, sir, uh, you you call me here. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> was the fool. I mean, I had no lie. I, I, you know, sometimes it's hard to take criticism, but you have to take it. Like I said, good or bad, you have yeah. to, to be willing to accept it. And, and I agree with you 100%. Um, you know, the numbers don't lie, but I can tell you that one of the reasons why I was able to sell the business and, and get as much as I did is because the numbers didn't lie. Our profits, uh, you know, what we had as far as equity, um, you know, we had it appraised and the numbers even surprised me. Um, you know, it, it was because we had good books, you know, we, we, we kept good books and, and they were able to, to go and, and even have, you know, a number of, um, uh, customers that we had on our, our, our computer from just, you know, you could see how many repeat customers that were coming back to us. Uh, you know, all these numbers are value. I mean, it's just, and, and I like numbers. They just don't lie. They, they tell you the truth. You might not want to, you might not want to listen to the truth or look at it, but it's there. I mean, and I think that's the biggest thing too, was just understanding that, like I said, I did, did profit and loss. And we always, uh, before any, back in October, every October, I would sit down with my tax guy and we would go, we run a projection and, and kind of go, Hey, and this is where we've been this year. What do you think? You know, how is things looking? Yep. Okay. You know, or no, Hey, we need to do some adjustments. But we did this back in October. Yeah. You know, we didn't wait till crunch time because if I needed to make adjustments, I wanted to have the time to make adjustments. You know, I mean, th- those things were huge. And I could tell you some examples like, you know, I need, I know I need to buy three, four semi loads of sugar to feed the bees. Do I buy that in December or do I hold off and buy that in January? I'm still buying the same amount of sugar, but buying it December 31st 
or January 1st has huge tax implications. Those are, type of, those are types of conversations that you need to have. And you need to have a good CPA that can tell you, hey, you know, th th this is going to hurt you or this is going to help you. Because whether or not I feed that sugar right now or it sits in my building until next year, it can sit there all at once. If it helps me keep money in my pocket, that's what matters. And that's, once again, you were saying about the sweet spot. It seemed like, you know, it used to be that how many bees you had, that's kind of how big you were in the industry. I don't care if I was the smallest commercial guy there was. As long as I had more money in my pocket at the end of the day, that's all that matters. You know, it's about what the, what I retained as far as earnings. You know? And one, th one thing that people misunderstand about commercial guys that I try to teach, but I think it's hard for people from outside to see it if they don't know it, is that because you depend on your bees, you care so much about them, they're the best good-looking bees i ever seen, you know. People have this tendency to under to believe that oh, commercial guys are all about the money, you know. That's true. They they have a lot of they're supposed to have money in their heads. There is no scene in making money, and but at the same time, because they depend on the bees, they care so much and they find their ways to. There is no way to make money with bees with crappy bees. That's you know they need they need healthy bees healthy to make bees. money. So. If they don't have healthy bees, they don't have operation. Remember I told you I went over to Mitzka's and he taught me about the queen operation? One of the, the, the best things, the advice that I picked up from it was, was, was it was non, I mean, it, it sticks to me to this day, it tells you, is that, you know, they had, I, I don't remember exactly, four or five kids and they were all working in, in, in the bees at the time. You know, and they've grown up now, but they were all working at the bees in time. And I, I looked at Dave. I said, Dave, I said, man, you you treat these bees almost better than you treat your kids. You know, you, you know, he's out there. He's caring for those bees. I mean, he does. He was, he really, you know, and he was always experimenting. Actually, it's where I picked up. He was always tweaking a recipe, trying this, you know, putting bananas in, in a pallet pollen patty because it's potassium. You know, I never, I would have never thought of that. You know, he was innervating things like that. And his, his response to my question or my, my statement was, Mario, if I don't treat these bees better than my kids, I cannot feed my kids. It had always stuck with me. You know, he had a, he had a point. You, these bees are your livelihood. And if you don't take care of them, you cannot take care of your family. And I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a powerful statement that he made, and I, it stuck with me. The one other statement that a, a beekeeper that I helped out when I was young, and he's passed away, but I'm, I wouldn't say he's a mentor, but he was a very important influence on me. Uh, he taught me about making sure the numbers. My grandfather taught me a lot about the numbers, but he was, he was a real stickler for numbers. He told me one time, he says, Mario, if you take care of the small things, the big things will take care of themselves. And, and it took me a couple of years to understand what he was talking about, but he did because he was always out there tinkering with the bobcat. You know, he'd be out there in the mornings before anybody else and, and you know, making sure the truck tires were aired up and, and you know, everything was, was good to go for, for the, that day. You know, and I was like, damn, man, you're always out here. What, what are you, why are you always doing this stuff? But if you take care of the little things, then you don't have any big problems. Your bobcat won't break down. You won't have a blowout on the interstate when you load it down with honeybees. You know, those are some of the things that yep. that it took me a while to understand. But once I got it, I was like, oh, oh okay, I understand what you mean. You know, just, just make sure all those little things, the things that you can control. There are a lot of things you can't control, but the things you can control if you make sure that they, everything works, then you don't have a problem, you know? So. Yeah. yeah, I think you said it all, Mario. You said it all. Wow. So now you're very successful, retired, living in the Keys, enjoying life because yeah. of the bees. Here we go. <laughs> it can be done. I mean, there's some Aero guys that have done it too. Um, there's a lot of guys that are looking to do it now. I mean, there's guys looking to get in the bee business and guys looking to get out of the bee business. 
And I think what I want to see more, you know, so the industry growing to that direction, you know, like in poultry and and cows and, you know, these big industries. And and maybe I'm speaking for myself because right now I don't have much space for what I do, you know, as a consultant. But when the the industry is bigger, like cows and poultry, you know, you have several consultants working with the single, with the single organization, you know, And, and, and right now. For my space, it's, it's very small. I need, I work with just a hand of of, of people. You know, I, I would love to see the industry growing to that direction to to be more stable. I would say to stable so it can s- stabilize everybody's life a little bit. I I would too. It's a sad because you know, like I say, when I was on the board of the ABF, you know, they did a lot of um, lobbying up in DC. And we were always the little guys. I mean, even though we produced a lot of, without us, we wouldn't have the pollination for even the cattle feed or the, the catfish or the the pink feed, because all that is, you know, alfalfa or clover that is pollinated, you know, by the honeybees and, um, you know, or the almond. I mean, almonds are a billion dollar industry, you know, and yet we seem to be the little guy on the block. And nobody takes us seriously. And it just, you know, it's like here in Florida. I can tell you this much. I mean, when the orange industry had the huge problem with greening and canker, you know, the state freed up, um, it was $2 billion overnight. I mean, they built a whole other facility at UF, at the, at the university, just to handle citrus, you know. And yet here we fought for, what, six years to get a bee lab? You know, I mean, uh, it, it was terrible to try to get any money from the state to help with the bee lab. You know, it was mostly um, funded from the beekeepers. You know, I'm proud to say that, you know, I was one of the first to to, to help with the funding and, and, and help promote it because I just saw the value in it. You know, we needed to have more research on things. Um, sometimes the research works a little slower than I'd like it to, but we still need the research. Um, and it's important. I just, just, I think bees are, are, are overlooked a lot of times, um, you know, for these other big crops. And if they have a problem, you know, Oh my my God, we got to fix that problem right away. But when the bees have a problem, it's, eh, we'll get to it eventually, whatever, you know, and, and it's sad. It is. Um, but, I think that's the reality of it, you know, and um, I will say, though, out of what's happened, you know, with colony collapse and um, with COVID, too, um, you've had a lot, a huge um, spike in people being interested in bees. And, of course, the backyard beekeeper has evolved from this. I mean, I can tell you in the state of Florida— in the last three years, it has doubled. I don't know if you knew this when you were down here or when, since you left, but, you know, when it, the, the, the numbers, because I, I knew some of the inspectors and they were friends with them, um, you know, there were about 3,000 registered commercial, or not commercial, sorry, beekeepers, just beekeepers in general in Florida. And I last checked, um, we're up to over six. That's crazy. I mean, that's just, you know, it's great for the industry. Uh, and the awareness of honeybees is, is huge. It's brought a huge awareness to honeybees. But once again, this is not 3,000 new commercial beekeepers. This is just 3,000 new backyard beekeepers, um, which they do have a voice. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that we, you know, we've got an army behind us um, because once again, these 3,000, you know, new Backyard beekeepers, they probably have one, two, maybe five hives in the backyard. Okay. Just, just to say, let's just say they have three on the average. Okay. So, you know, you've got 9,000 new bees in the state of Florida. That's great. That's awesome. I'm happy about that. But that really could be just two commercial guys here. Yep. From the bee population. Do you see what I'm saying? But the thing is, is that with two commercial guys, you you know, if you have a vote on something in Tallahassee at our, at our state or in D.C., you've got only two commercial votes. 
yeah, you know, hey, we want you to vote this way on whatever, you know, political yep. thing you're trying to do. But when you've got 3,000 people wanting to vote your way, now you've got, you know, congressmen, senators that are starting to pay attention and start looking at this industry, I think, a little closer. So those are kind of my thoughts about that. Wow. So it's growing. Yeah. It, it, the industry is always shifting and changing, and that's... That's is you know scary but exciting at the same time, and it's about the beekeeper to also change and adapt the same way the bees does all the time in nature to survive. I think it that would be my final thought is that anybody that's looking to do this is you have to be open to change. I mean, like I said, I wasn't going to go to California. I went to California, you know. Uh, you have to be willing to change with this industry um, because it's ever changing. Business is constantly changing. The world is constantly changing. You have to be able to not be set in your ways. And I think that's where a lot of the old beekeepers, the ones that are not successful, they're stuck in their ways. They're stuck in a rut. You know, this is the way my dad did it, and this is the way I'm going to do it, and that's it. Well, that might have worked for your dad, but the world's a different place now. You know, I mean... Like we talked about, there's a decline in just um, the land, you know, just the habitat. So you might not be able to get as much honey production that your dad did because the orange trees or clover or whatever you're trying to make honey off of doesn't exist anymore. They've planted something else in place of it. Yep. So yeah. you have to be able to adapt, you know, um, to make sure that your business survives. Yep. Well, you said it all, Mario. Uh, any other message to people at home? If, if I don't know if you want to give them your contact information for for consultant business, or you're going to be overload. So I, I'll leave I'll leave up to you. Uh, if you have anything to say, we we can address now. Otherwise, I will I will finish this. Part. We'll leave it for another time, and uh, right. you know you might, you might have me back on again, and and we can discuss that. Um, but uh, like I said, I've got I've got quite a few clients now, and and uh, you know that I help them out, and uh, I can say that their their apiaries are very successful. Um, you know, and I'm happy with, with what I do. I get to pass on my knowledge, um, and but I don't have the stress of running a <laughs> a business now. You know, so I really enjoy being back in the bees. I really, really, it's in my blood. Really enjoy it. But um, I don't have all the, the headaches that came with a running a business. Yeah. You know? That being said, I want to I wanna announce here that there is some conversations happening between myself and Mario regarding an a online structure course so we can use our education here to teach people about bees and commercial beekeeping, more, more specialized in commercial beekeeping and transitions. So we, we, we are... It's starting some conversation, so I hope I hope we're gonna go somewhere. Let's see. Uh, so that's exciting to 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 have these conversations, Mario. Well, thank you, thank you for having me on. I, I do appreciate it. <laughs>